Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Rafael, and this is Christian. We're both part of the Open Tech team at IBM, uh, where we primarily work on as, as uh, open source software developers on, on Model Mesh and more recently KKIP and adjacent projects there. So today we're going to talk a bit about a few things. I guess this is an outline here where we're going to talk about model serving. I'm going to talk about why it, what it is and why we need it. Uh, some of the things that we do to actually um, get models into production. Then uh, I'll introduce Model Mesh and KServe, which are two open source projects, and I'll talk a bit about that. Then we'll move to the model inferencing side. Uh, Christian will introduce KKIT and, and run through a bit of a demo as well. So as we probably all know by now, uh, model serving or, or I guess ML ops or machine learning lifecycle, it involves way more than just training a model and putting it out there. Uh, all of the models that we, we interact with online, LLMs, anything, you know, they're all deployed somewhere. And that, that concept is model serving, right? And model serving is basically deploying trained models in production. Well, making them available to consumers uh, to be able to send them inference requests and actually receive its output. Uh, and ultimately, this is to actually incorporate the AI that we've, we've created, right? these models that we've built, uh, and incorporate that value into an application or, or end user. So one of the ways that we do this is to actually treat a model as a microservice and expose it to clients as an API endpoint, whether that's REST or, or gRPC. Uh, and this mirrors the strategies used for existing software stacks today, which may be why it's popular, because developers already have a certain familiarity with this, this process. Uh, but when it comes to deploying models like this, there are a bunch of considerations and a lot of obstacles along the way. Uh, for example, how do we actually containerize a model? Uh, are inference response times acceptable? Um, and then how do we handle different frameworks and different model formats? There's so many out there, TensorFlow, PyTorch, ML Server, and so on. Uh, there's also other questions like, is a model underscaled or overscaled? When we're deploying many models, maybe some are used more heavily than others, uh, and are we actually using those resources efficiently and, and and, and giving the models those resources that they actually need. Um, there might even be questions of like how to handle rollouts, new versions of models. Are we uh, just updating models or are we deploying new models, which are new versions and, and holding on to these old models that are no longer gonna be used? Um, so there's a lot of questions. And that's where an open source project like KServe comes in. Uh, so KServe is a, a standard cloud agnostic model inference platform based entirely on Kubernetes, and it's built for these kind of highly scalable use cases. It has a few high-level features. Um, for example, it provides a, a standardized inference protocol, uh, which is important because these, uh, many of these frameworks, such as PyTorch or, or, or TensorFlow, have accepted and even participate in implementing this, this protocol. Uh, it also supports modern serverless inference workload with request-based auto-scaling, including scale to zero on both CPU and GPU. And then it has many other features like pluggable um, features and support for, for things like pre and post processing, so manipulating the data before it actually gets to the model. Um, monitoring, which is not just on the ops side, but also monitoring things like uh, how the model's performing, like bias or, or drift, uh, and explainability as well. So with machine learning becoming more widely adopted in organizations, and especially in this era of large language models, it can be advantageous to deploy a large number of models. For example, maybe a news classification service may train custom models for each news category. Uh, and, and there's a lot of kind of uh, positives from that. And another important reason for why organizations might train a lot of these models is to protect data privacy because it can be safer to isolate users' data and train models separately. But while you get the benefit of better inference accuracy and data privacy by building models for each use case like this, it's more challenging, especially once you get into the hundreds, the thousands, the tens of thousands, the hundreds of thousands of models and deploying all of those on a Kubernetes cluster. And so this is where you get into these hard limitations, like obviously resource limitations and, 
and even stronger limitations like the maximum pod limitation, Kubernetes, and additionally the maximum IP address limitation. So that's where you get into um, an, another project which is connected to, to KServe, and it's basically the multi-model back-end um, option in KServe, which is Model Mesh. And Model Mesh is a, a multi-model serving framework, and it was open sourced by IBM a couple of years ago. Uh, it was used in production for about maybe eight or nine years, and it continues to be used today, underpinning a bunch of cloud um, or Watson products such as Watson X Assistant, Watson Natural Language Understanding, and so on. And these are kind of products where, uh, at least I think that Model Mesh came uh, to fruition because of these cases where um, IBM was allowing users to come and build their own models. And they might have been small, little language models at the time, uh, but a lot of them were maybe left over and not used as frequently. You also have these situations where maybe certain times of the year models are used while other times they're not. And so you get into this, this situation where you need to underscale or, or overscale models. And, and Model Mesh kind of um, is designed for that use case, like these high scale, high density, frequently changing model use cases. And the main thing that it does is it actually loads and unloads models to and from memory to strike a balance between responsiveness to users and, of course, their, their computational footprint or their, their resource uh, efficiency. And so, therefore, the number of models which can be deployed in a cluster will no longer be limited by the maximum pod limitation. Because another thing I, I guess I failed to mention is that KServe is actually primarily working in the pod per model paradigm, um, which means that every model that you deploy one pod spins up, and then maybe there's, there's ex, extra pods, like a transformer or something adjacent to it. So if you have maybe a handful of pods for every model, scaling that up is pretty difficult in, in the use case where you're going into like thousands of models. Uh, model mesh, though, is multiple models kind of packed into a pod. Uh, and so that's why these like, maximum pod limitations or IP address limitations are no longer um, relevant. And so, again, at a higher level, the model mesh features at a glance are here. We have cache management, where pods are, are managed as a distributed, um, least recently used cache, uh, which means that, that models are loaded and unloaded based on usage recency and current request volume. So this means that if a model is, you know, has not been touched in a long time, then it probably will be unloaded by this logic. Uh, but if a model is heavily used, then it'll continue to be loaded and stay loaded. Then there's intelligent placement and loading. Model placement is balanced both by the cache age, how long it's been in the cache across pods, as well as the request loads. Uh, for example, if a particular model is under heavy load, it'll be scaled across more pods. Uh, and then we have resiliency. Failed model loads are automatically retried in different pods, and rolling updates are also handled automatically. So that's an overview of model mesh and KServe, and I guess the, the, the model serving side, right, deploying models into production. Um, but from there, we need to, even when a model is deployed and ready to be consumed, one actually needs to know how to inference it. And developers who write applications that consume AI models are not necessarily AI experts who understand the intricate models or the intricate details of the models that they use. Uh, for example, some considerations here are that not all runtimes support all models. Uh, most of them, if not all of them, are proprietary and each look and feel a bit different. There's no real standardization between them. Um, dealing with different data structures, right? What kind of data do I actually have to pass to this model and what kind of data structure do I expect to receive from it? Um, interfaces usually uh, depend on the runtime and the model. So this is something you have to consider when you're, you're thinking about which model inference API to use. And, uh, and then there's an overhead that, that is, um, they're serving models from other runtimes incur overhead uh, when they're trained in one runtime and you try to port it over to another for, for deployment. So ideally, and I guess I'll, I'll kind of uh, explain maybe the ideal scenario for a developer is that we can deploy or we can treat models as a black box function for their users and it's similar to, to cloud computing where you might deploy an application to the cloud 
but you don't necessarily have the detailed knowledge of the cloud infrastructure surrounding it. Uh, and this comes with some, some benefits. For example, uh, you might consider something like configurable backends, which allow models to be created in uh, different runtimes and be served in a runtime agnostic way. That's ideal. Um, there's also a trend to specify APIs around a problem space as opposed to a specific model. For example, uh, you would write an interface for text summarization and maybe a different interface for code generation. Uh, ultimately, not all users are interested in the inner workings of a model or how it's deployed, and, and this abstraction between the author and the user would allow us to focus on more things like load balancing uh, to different model instances and to different versions, but without having to change any of the model's code. And so to that end, I, I, I'll introduce Christian here, my colleague, who's going to introduce uh, the project KKIT, which does a lot of those things. Thanks, Rafael. Yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> so KKIT um, is really an AI toolkit. Um, and the idea for KKIT is, 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 is that when working with AI models, um, we have different roles involved in the process. There are MLOps engineers, there are application developers, there are, of course, the data science scientists who work on those models. And they usually all work in their own realms. And one of the aims of KKIT is to bring all of those user roles together. Um, so have the, the model offers and the model users um, using the same framework. So with KKIT, um, ideally, you should be able to, to train your, your, your models and use them and have a bunch of um, simplified APIs um, and very clearly defined um, data structures that help with that process of creating AI models and using them and then integrating them into your applications. And that hasn't been easy so far, and most application developers, including myself, are not AI expert or data scientists. So having a toolkit that makes it easy to integrate AI models to solve a task, to solve a problem, um, is really useful. And so you can see in this little architecture chart here, we have those two roles of model authors and model users or operators. Um, and they would typically want to interact with, with simplified APIs. And if they work with KKIT, um, they can request a model to do some inferencing or um, submit a training job. And this is all done via REST APIs that I'll show in, in a bit. Um, but KKIT itself provides a gRPC server, and that then that process can run locally um, on your laptop uh, while you're doing your development work. Um, and then in production, typically, you would deploy it somewhere on the cloud infrastructure um, based on Kubernetes or Red Hat OpenShift. Um, so I'm going to explain in the next couple of slides how, K how KKIT actually does that. Um, so the conceptual view for KKIT is, is that it is an abstraction layer um, that allows application developers and model creators to consume AI and work with AI models uh, seamlessly. Um, so here are the two user profiles um, that we're touching on. Um, the, the AI model author, of course, is the, you know, typically a data scientist who creates the models, you know, who, who takes care of, of getting good data, um, who knows how machine learning models work, different algorithms work, um, and produces the model. Um, the model operator um, is typically more like, like an application developer, right? somebody who wants to use the model, who doesn't necessarily have to understand um, the, the internal workings and intricate details. But as application developers, we're used to using toolkits, right? Um, if you work with Python or Go, there are libraries to solve almost any kind of challenge. And even though we like to program ourselves, we are very hesitant to reinvent the wheel, right? And if there's a library out there that does something better than we could, um, we like to use that. And we got used to that over the past decade or so. Um, AI doesn't work like that as of now. Um, with the emergence of Hugging Face, though, AI models become widely available um, to application developers, but it's still a challenge um, for somebody who doesn't have the background. All right, so KKIT, how does it actually do that thing? Um, now, KKIT has two main concepts, um, the concept of modules and runtimes. So as you can imagine, runtimes is the part of, of, the, uh, of the program that actually runs your model, right? You need to deploy your AI model somewhere. Um, and there are different runtimes for training, different runtimes for inference, right? Um, we use Ray for training, uh, Ray for serving, Ray serve. Um, there's the text generation. Um, inference server or Triton to serve models for inferencing. And then the, on the usage side, uh, we like to think of 
um, AI models like, like a task that solves, right? There's text summarization models where you want to give the application a piece of text and you want to get the summary back. Um, or you want to analyze sentiments in chats, right? You don't want to, you just want to, you know, give as an input actual chat text and get the sentiment back and not tensors. Um, and so KKIT designs um, the user interfaces around a task to be solved. And of course, there's, you know, natural language processing, vision tasks, um, and I'll go into more details in a bit. Um, here is a bit of a, an overview chart of how the application, you know, works. Um, the top blue corner, that's your application. Um, and then via KKIT, um, you talk to different runtimes. So in this picture, it's a distributed example. You have several KKIT runtimes, so probably running somewhere on cloud infrastructure. And you can see that when an application developer requests a model, um, I think in this diagram you see model X for task A and model AB, task B, right? The task is what you, what you want to do, text summarization, you know, natural language understanding. Um, and then the bigger orange box is a KKIT runtime. And there are actually multiple instances here for load balancing. And in that KKIT runtime, all of the models that, that runtime makes available, um, they are being served. And you can see there is a, um, a backend adapter so KKIT itself is not the runtime, or you know, doesn't have to be the runtime itself, but it uses inference servers like Triton um, or TGIS here to actually do the heavy lifting. And then of course the pink box, the router, depending on what um, application or what model or what task you wanna, uh, uh, you know, you're working with, then the router decides uh, where to serve that request, wherever the model is being deployed. And that leads me to my demo. For that, I have to ask for a moment of patience because I have to swap screens. All right, I'm gonna start with um, our GitHub repository or the GitHub organization really for KKIT. So if you go to GitHub um, and find KKIT, um, you'll see a few repositories and then there's the KKIT main repository that has the actual, uh, the actual code. Um, for the project, and there, then there are um, some projects that will help you make use of it. And so there is the, the KKIT template that will help you, I'll show that later, will help you get started, where you can create your own GitHub repository with all of the KKIT infrastructure, so to speak, um, laid out for you, where you can fill in your individual tasks fairly easily. And um, for developers who you know, just want to get started quickly and most likely are using Hugging Face models, um, Mark, who's in the room here too, he has created this awesome Hugging Face um, demo, which I'm gonna showcase. So I'm gonna click on this real quickly. When you open this repository up, it will tell you what it is, right? It's, um, um, you know, there are simple configurations for various um, uh, Hugging Face models. Um, there are some setup steps that I will, um, that I've already gone through. And then once you have it locally, you have a choice of um, running a, a few example tasks. There's a, a sentiment analysis, there's text summarization, even a text generation task. Um, and I'm gonna show the object detection. Um, all right, so when you clone this, right, you've all done this before, you copy the URL, and then you would probably open it up in one of your favorite IDEs, um, or whatever works for you. Um, I'm using PyCharm here. And you can see I cloned this repository earlier, and you see the project structure here. Hold on, let me close this, lack of preparation. And then typically you land with the readme, and the readme um, nicely tells you all the steps you have to go through in order to get this up and running. Um, it shows you the prerequisites, right? You need to have Python, obviously. Um, you wanna work with virtual environments, which I have already set up, and then you install all of, all of your requirements. And that's all you need to do. Um, and then, in this repository, you find in the KaiKit Hacking Phase demo um, folder, you see examples, as I mentioned a minute ago, um, and there are examples for you know, image classification, object detection, um, sentiment analysis, text summarization. And then you can choose which of those you wanna try out first, and then you copy that into a models directory, which by default is where KKIT expects your models. Of course, they can be configured. Um, I did that just before the demo, and I'm gonna start by running it. So running it is, is fairly straightforward. You just start the app, or if you have a really cool UI, uh, IDE, you can just click on the little run button here. I'm gonna go the old-fashioned way on my terminal. 
And then, so when you start the app, it will bring up the CACIT process, um, spin up the gRPC server, and it will tell you which models were loaded. And then you have this URL that you can click on, and you're presented with this really cool Gradio UI in your web browser. And here you can see um, there are three tabs. Those are the three models I selected. There's a sentiment analysis, object detection, image segmentation. I'm going to try this out real quick. Okay, here I'm entering my text. Um, let's see, it's already, okay, it's already giving me um, a sentiment. This is good, positive. This demo, this demo is negative, is going also negative. Well, that's positive. All right, I think that's positive. And then let's try object detection. This wants me to upload an image. I did find a couple of cat, cat images on the internet just to showcase this. I'm going to upload this here. And then very quickly, this hugging face model that we're wrapping here found that there's a couch with a cat. And it even found a potted plant right there in the back. So that works. Now, um, in the repository that I showed you earlier, none of these things are magic, right? You could, um, can easily see that um, all of these uh, models, um, they have a configuration file. And the configuration file is fairly slim. In this case, it's just an ID. And then we're mapping those IDs um, to actual modules. Right? And if I look at the uh, sentiment analysis here, I'll find the sentiment analysis task. Right? And there's the actual code. So this is a hugging phase module. Right? We're extending from module base. And then every module um, typically has a load method that tells Kakit how to instantiate that module. Um, here you would find um, this is a hugging face um, transformer pipeline. You've probably done this before. Um, and it's just a simple wrapper around it. Right? It loads the config file and then you know, loads that pipeline. And then, of course, you have a run method. That's the actual interface, um, so to speak, the API that a, a, a user or a developer would want to interact with. And this is fairly straightforward. Right? Um, each, each of our um, inferences where would give us a class info, right? That's our sentiment, the label positive or negative, and the score with the confidence. And that class info object is part of our data model, which you'll find under all the data models. Um, and there, it's fairly straightforward, right? You have the prediction with its classes, a list of classes, two in our case, and you know there's a confidence and the actual class name. So that's fairly straightforward. Now, that is fun, fun to play around with. But then, how would you go about doing it yourself? And for this, we would want to go back to the um, Kkit um, GitHub repository. And here, you should find the Kkit template. And the Kkit template is just a GitHub template, which you might have done before, which lays out the typical project structure for a Kkit project. Right? You can see um, it has your, um, your server code, your client code, um, and then of course, the actual Kkit modules and the data model uh, all laid out for you. And this you can typically um, use by clicking on the Use This Template button, and then you would create your own repository. I'll call it Kkit Demo. And this I already did, so it's not available anymore. So I did this here um, just before the demo and cloned it, and I brought it up in my PyCharm IDE. And just as you saw the structure, uh, on the GitHub repo for the template, right? You have your, your template code. You would probably refactor and rename that to whatever you're trying to achieve. And then in that folder, you have your configuration, configuration files um, that tells you know, the Kkit runtime, which models you have, what the interfaces are, what the data model is. Um, you would have your actual module code. And the data model does, describes um, the inputs and the outputs of your model. Now, in the template itself, you have these Hello World examples. And they're really straightforward. It's just you know text in, text out. And then I added a text sentiment task in here. And I used the code that you can actually also find on the Kkit website. Um, I'm going to jump back. Forgive me for a second. So when you go to Kkit, the Kkit uh, repository, there's a link to the Kkit website. I'm going to go here real quick. Or there it was too, um, which has all the information you would need. Um, that website describes you know, what Kkit is, how it works. And it has this tryout tab that mirrors the same um, project structure I just showed in the template, um, gives you a few setup steps, 
and even the code you can use to wrap up your hugging, to wrap your hugging face module. So this is basically what I did. I followed these steps, um, and I filled this in into my KKit template, re template repository. This is the code you see here in the text sentiment and the classification. <coughs> Excuse me. And then um, if you follow the readme that is in that repository too, um, you can easily find out how to actually run it. Right? So you have your, your demo has a server um, where you start your runtime. I'm going to do this right here. And then here you would probably see a few deprecation warnings because I'm using an older Python version. Um, and then it shows you the URL that you can um, open up in your browser to see the fast API. Um, I should do this, docs. Right. So fast API used to be Swagger or Open API, and it's a very easy way to um, document your APIs and to actually try them out. So here you see we have this Hello World task that comes with the template repository, and I added this sentiment analysis task, and here we can click try it out, and then I think the model ID is text sentiment, oops. And then let's see if that works, if I got the ID right. It does something, yeah, it has a positive sentiment for what? Okay, my input here, there it is, text. Um, let's say today is a great day for a demo. We run this, and indeed it works, positive, positive sentiment very confidently. And let's try the opposite, today is a bad day. That should be negative, obviously. And indeed, that's negative. So that's really all I wanted to show, how easy it is to use KKit, um, where to find it, and how to get started using it yourself, and looking at you know, all the examples, and then that should help you to you know, wrap all kinds of hugging face, or even just use the, <coughs> the module wrappers we have, and swap out your hugging face model for whatever model you find. Um, do we have time for questions? We might have three minutes for questions. So just put up that slide with the, the contract. Hold on, hold on, yes, you're right. If I can find it. Yes, okay. And then this goes with, help me. Where's the presenter view? Slideshow, there you go. I lost the mouse. Go on. So okay. yeah, so these are just some links and some contact information, but links to uh, our, our, our GitHub repositories of the projects we, we talked about. And then specifically when it comes to model mission case serve, there's also a, um, a Slack channel uh, under the Kubeflow organization that you can join if you want to get involved or, or ask questions as well. Good. And that's it. Thanks, Phil. Oh. oh, there. Nice. I was wondering what's uh, next for KKIT and or for Model Mesh. If oh, you good question. That. You want to go first? Should I go first? Uh, you go first. Okay. So um, for Model Mesh, maybe. So Model Mesh really aims to um, to help with this high scalability use case, right? Where there's a, a lot of small models that get you know frequently shoveled in and out of memory or wherever you deploy that. But uh, more recently, and as you know, with ChatGPT and large language models, that paradigm is actually not really helping. Um, and so for large language models, <coughs> the focus goes back to um, KSERF, right? And then you know, trying to integrate runtimes that are, are well suited for large language models. But then along with large language models, there's also the fine tuning, right, or the prompt tuning. And so there is still a case for having a bunch of small models around one or two big models, right? So this is like really an area where we're, like, we're just exploring ourselves and finding it. Um, KKIT, however, plays a role there too. Um, for text generation inference, um, we're actually using KKIT uh, in a stack you know, along on, on Red Hat Data Science, for example. KKIT is used with Model Mesh and KSERF and TGIS um, to really you know, serve large language models and use cases around it. So it's like all one big bucket, in it, but it's in development. So I'm, I'm sure that within the next couple of months, um, Red Hat specifically, Red Hat Open Data Science, um, you know, you will actually be go out there, be able to go out there and explore, um, and maybe use KKIT uh, with a large language model served on 
on Reddit infrastructure. I don't know if there's anything. Yeah. I think yeah. that that's it. I think on the model mesh side, it's also, the, yeah, there's, it's, it's exploring more use cases with the LLMs. Maybe there's that use case of, like, I mentioned experimentation. Like, it's not just, okay, I have a large language model, it's, let's deploy that, but I might have multiple, multiple versions of it. And then what do you do with those, those ones that kind of, um, the older versions that aren't used as often, you know, this idea of loading in and out of memory and, and kind of trying to be efficient about resources with those types of models. Uh, I think there's, there's some use cases there that probably yeah. will be explored too. Yeah, great. Right. Thanks for the question. We wrapped it on time, huh? We did, okay. Nice. Nice. Thanks everyone. Thank you.